computer. All right, everybody, today's a special day. As you can see, you know me, Leroy Horton. I've been your co-host for quite a while. But my partner in crime, Dr. Walter Otka, is not here. But I do have the pleasure of introducing y'all to someone that's near and dear to my heart for the entirety of the last, like, half my life. Um, Thanks. Half your this, life. Yes. It. This is the, and I do put emphasis on the, because anyone in the industry, in the implant game, everyone knows who the Myra Haynes is. So I want to bid you the most heartfelt welcome, uh, Myra. So please give us a quick 30 second rundown on the special person that you are. Oh, gosh. Thank you, Dr. Horton. I don't know how special I am. And anyone that knows me is probably because I'm either loud or obnoxious, but love people and love patients. So Yes, mm -hmm. been in the implant world for a little while. Started back in like 2006, seven, um, with various names with the company, Paragon, Calcitech, uh, and then Zimmer. I think mm -hmm. most <clears throat> people are familiar with that name. It's still out there. It is a large biologics and um, medical device company, but they've spun off um, recently and they have a different name. There's Zim V, um, right? Yeah. It's, yeah. Is it Zim V? Yeah, it's Zim V. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So just kind of progressively started in Pacific Northwest. That's how I met Dr. Leroy. Moved up to Colorado and managed a team there. And was doing that for about 10 or 15 years. Still here, now going back and forth. Um, and have had various opportunities in the implant world. Also worked for Norris Medical as the national sales director. Just bring up the sales team there and a portable. And now I'm consulting and doing the things that I love to do my whole life and adding some value into that. That's that's what's up. So well, let me give thank it you for having me. Absolutely. Welcome. I want to tell, Don't everybody, to tell uh, everybody I have COVID here. Oh <laughs> yeah. So a <laughs> no, listen, Myra I? is such a trooper. I texted her this morning and I said, yo, you still on for tonight, right? Now, mind you, on our end, faux pas, we didn't send out the reminder emails. That's why Walter's not here. He's on timeout because he didn't do yeah. his part. So we kicked That's we cool. kicked him off the program for the day, okay? <laughs> um, but uh, she was like, you know, Laura, I got, I got COVID. I'm on my deathbed. I got 105 temperature. But because I love you and it's you, I'll get dressed. I'll do my hair. And I'll come on. So thank you so much, Myra, for, for braving the world of COVID to do our little podcast. Uh, oh, thank I you. definitely appreciate you on that. I want to make sure we say the right things here. <clears throat> Absolutely. So let me just let me paint this picture. So I'm in dental school. There's one of two. I'm one of two black students in my class. Uh, me and Dr. Tiffany Bass, who's an amazing doctor in the Northwest. And for like the first three years, there's no one else that's black in the program. Then we finally get one. And U UW has had that reputation, right? So it can be culturally lonely. It was a great school at the time that I was there. So I can't complain about the academics. But I remember we had this implantology course, who I think was taught by like, who was it? Keith Phillips at the time. Yeah, Dr. Somebody. Phillips. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, they... We did an intro on the first day and they say, yeah, we're going to have the rep from Zimmer come down and we're going to do hands-on exercise. And so I don't think twice of it. We come down in the lab. I look across and who do I see? I see Myra Haynes. And me and Tiffany are like, yo, the rep's a sister? Like, <laughs> we got to meet her. Now, obviously, when it comes to us seeing each other from across the room and you're like, hey, there's another Black person, there's an immediate cultural Proclivity to just make a connection, right? Yeah. So that that that's an initiator, okay? Once we met, you, when I say, and I, I say this without um, hoping everybody really takes me seriously, you birthed me into the implant game. Because it wasn't just, oh, you were there and you happened to be Black. You went out of your way to make sure that I felt welcome, that I had my resources, not just while we were in school, but beyond, right? We I used Zimmer for the first couple of years out of practice, and you were one of my main reps. I would see you at all the um, the conventions. You got me, you know, into the you know on a whim. I was like, hey, Myra, you know, what's out there? What should I do? You were like, hey, 
I'm going to bring you to the Zimmer Institute. I got your name down. Don't worry. Like you are so instrumental in me being what I am today. So everyone, like people have heard your name that will never meet you because you're a part of my story everywhere that I go. And so I just want to, you know, I know I'm laying it on thick, but I have such a love and appreciation for you because you really put me on to what I do today, which I have a love and a passion for. Um, so you were instrumental to that. So can you tell us in the beginning, when you were working at the school, when you were rep working with doctors, what did the landscape in the industry look like? Because it's crazy different now, but what was it right. back in the early 2000s? Yeah, no, great question. First, I want to say thank you for the compliment. Um, it's nice to be appreciated once in oh, a while. Absolutely. When you've been in the industry for a while, people take that for granted, and I certainly do not. But you did it all on your own, so I think that. <clears throat> I think when you have a passion for, you know, taking care of the people that's in front of you, no matter what you do, you're going to be successful. Um, but the landscape, yes, it's changed substantially. And as I continue to grow old, I feel like I'm falling, you know, short on kind of keeping up with the times. But I laugh about a few things. Um, if I can just give some examples, you know. Mm -hmm. I think when I became the Seattle rep, we, I was number 35 and you know how large Zimmer is at this time, <clears throat> but you know, we were selling 50 to hundred implant packages for 50, $60,000. So I would say anyone that gripes about 10 or 20 implants from an implant company for $4,000 because they don't want to spend the money should be something that they should reconsider. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's one or two cases. Back then it was, it was a, quite a bit, right? <clears throat> and really, really difficult to actually um, convert anyone because it was the specialist that was placing the implants. Mm -hmm. And although we had a few general practitioners placing back then, it really was a no-no to have that happen. So get the referring doctor to love your system, to understand how to restore the case, to get them to send it to the specialist. And the specialist will say, Okay, Myra, I'll give you a chance. They still wouldn't buy your system. Mm. So, you know, I had two specialists kind of grew from 250,000 to 3 million over three years because of the service and education that we offered. And it was the education that kind of set us apart, even though, you know, at that time, Strauman or Nobel kind of ran the show with, you know, having six or seven reps. We were a very small company back then. Right. Um, <clears throat> Center Pulse, I think it was the company name. But I would say a lot of that really just through fruition. I think people seeing hard work and dedication and the annoyance of me coming around over and over again <laughs> is what allowed us to kind of help grow. Um, I think in addition to that, the University of Washington was a huge right assistance when we had students graduate. We were in the oral surgery, perio, and the um, third year residency program for general practitioners that were getting ready to graduate, we had um, a lot of momentum. People mm -hmm. like to use what they were educated on. And so that helped grow that Pacific Northwest market too. So right. hopefully that gives you some insight of what we did back then. In addition to, you know, everything was, um, I would say analog, mm -hmm. you know, back then and, you know, not to go into what's new today. And I think that's a question you're going to ask, but I'll kind of stop right there. I mean, any yeah. questions on that specifically? No, that's a, that's a great history. Cause I don't think a lot of the, especially the newer graduating docs really realized what was going on back then in the early 2000s to early 2000s, it was almost exclusively specialists that were placing implants. You had to be really special as a GP, not only to be, you know, get the training to do it efficiently and do it correctly, but to be able to afford to get the training because CE back then was really expensive. Um, and it, the, the industry hadn't quite shifted to turn its head to the GP. Right. Now, you, right. how did that transition look to you where you said, okay, all these big companies, they're backing off the specialists because we already got them. They're in the bag. Right. We want to sell more units. Let's get these GPs. What did that look like? And did you have any reservations as that evolution started to? Oh, to yeah, unturn? that's a great question. I didn't, since it took me so long, it took me a year, over a year and a half to 
get one specialist on mm -hmm. board with our system. After that trickled, I mean, it was rolling. So honestly, I turned down every general practitioner that wanted to place implants with me. Really? For about a year until okay. I couldn't do it any longer. Mm -hmm. So two folds, a, the company at my manager at the time, I think supported me. Um, and the specialists were more threatening me that that couldn't happen, but it would because I would have to go to the specialist and how I decided to run my business was, okay, you know what? Dr. Horton called me. He wants to start placing Zimmer. I went back to the specialist to tell them with the permission of the general practitioner mm -hmm. and asked, are you okay with this? Because they are going to move forward with the different company. If I don't sell it to them, I have an obligation with the organization. I'm starting to lose momentum. How do you want me to handle it? So I would support them by saying, you know what, do your singles, make sure that we do this right, get a CT scan if we even had it or x-ray at that time, and let's start sending other cases to the specialist. What other opportunities do we have? And so I try to find some, you know, more complicated cases to help leverage not losing some of that business. It wasn't, it's was a game that I could not stop and the specialist just had to go with it. Right. Right. I probably ticked off a few and lost <laughs> some, but I think that was the game in the industry to <clears throat> help support and still kind of as a manager or director that I've trained any of my reps today, the exact same way. Right. Just right. be honest. If we lose them, we lose them. I mean, it's nothing that we can do, but we have to learn how to, you know, take it to the next level as we continue to progress in our career. <clears throat> Right now, now I remember going to the the AID conventions and the ICOI, and I'd walk into the vendor booth yeah. venue, right, and I would see you there with your, you know, your 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 Zimmer garb on, and you were clearly leading a team, right? What's it like for someone like yourself? You're female, you're multi uh, racial, right? Uh, African American and Japanese, was it? Korean. Korean. Right. Whatever gets me the loan application, I'm gonna check. <laughs> right. Whatever right. boxes you got to check, right? <laughs> but, but but proud African American. <laughs> but but clearly, you're in a space that at times can be male dominated, right? Which we mm -hmm. we, I'm a guy and I, I like to support my brothers, but we do sometimes bring an energy that's not conducive to having you know female colleagues be in a space where they're the only one, right? Yeah. We right. you know. What was that like for you coming up in the game where you're not only dealing with being in a male dominant space as a woman, but now you're also a woman of color who is moving up the ranks and now you're a leader. Cause when I, when I met you, you was, a. I met you. And then later on, like you were a big honcho regional, no, you were a regional been. manager with, with Zimmer at one point, right? Yep. Right. Right. Yeah. So you was up there. What, what was that like for you? Well, the titles, I mean, it's, it is nice and I, uh, I don't want to get too much into it. I, it has not been easy. My, my whole career, I think our parents, you know, my dad being African-American, the same, you know, living practically in the slavery days and deep South of Alabama has really made it evident how important it is to not just have this education, but to be proud of who you are. I think both sides of the culture of being Korean and African American living in a white dominated world forever, right? Not really surrounding myself with any African Americans my whole life. I think my mm -hmm. parents kind of took me out of that thinking it's the way to go, the best way to go. Um, but I think working twice as hard and setting it an example um, and, you know, never taking for granted that I was a leader. I did everything that I continue to do as I would do as a rep, right? right. Like today, if I, like I said earlier to Dr. Horton, it's, if I will clean toilets. I'm just started my consulting business. I'll do whatever it takes to try to help grow this is because this brand's make a new, right. But it was not easy. Um, and 
there's been a lot of opportunities within the organization that they passed me up on and because somebody else received it. And I try to stop and think, you know what? It's not because I'm African-American. I, I just don't because I'm very faith-based. But in the end, it was specifically because I don't think it was the African-American. It was more of the female mm -hmm. um, side of things, but that's still somewhat of a discrimination. But I just continue plugging away and doing the best I can. And people succeed because of the numbers. And unfortunately, they don't see the value and the character of someone versus how successful I was bringing all the numbers into the organization. And it took me a long time. A lot of a lot of people got it way long earlier than I did. So, you right. know, it's what it is, but it was not easy. You know, and I think that's a testament to the, there's a, there's a number of people I've heard say that black people in America are the most forgiving and loving group. Right now, a lot of groups have had it hard, but obviously ours has been documented, you know, codified our struggles, yeah. you know, but we still have the capacity to love. And so when I hear you say it was hard, I had these struggles, and knowing the conversations we've had, you have not become embittered by that. If anything, that's right. actually accentuated. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but that's At a, times. it's <laughs> accentuated your love and it, given you the example of what you don't want to be. Yes, exactly. Right. right. And I think that's what people. I feel like sometimes that's what they look for so they can have an excuse not to give you an opportunity or to see that someone like myself could succeed, right? right? Am I the smartest person? Absolutely not. Does it take me a little bit longer? Do I have ADD? Absolutely. There's things that I have Absolutely. to do I can to build that. myself to know I need to be successful. Right. And it's difficult not to be in that, that pack of individuals of, corporate America over here, but right. deep down, you know, again, I talk about faith, God has a better plan and a purpose and whatever trials and struggles you go through, it's just only in the end going to make you even more successful. So right. that's what I try to look at, but have I been bitter? Do I get bitter? Am I bitter today? It's point. Yes. <laughs> but <laughs> you got to regroup and realize that this is still a great opportunity. No, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, what, is, what doesn't kill you make you stronger. Uh, right. You know, and I think um, for anyone listening that, you know, when we talk amongst ourselves, we get it because we've all been there. Right. Yeah. And I, I like to describe this, um, this parable, the story that my wife tells me, where she made sure she was on the hiring panel at her job, because what she noticed is that the hiring panel was almost specifically one single demographic. And when she got on the panel, what she noticed was when someone would come in from that same dem demographic, grew up in the same area, same background, the interviews were all super organically just, oh, you know, so-and-so, your daughter did this, my daughter did that. Mm -hmm. When someone came in, that was maybe a little different, you know, not in a bad way, but, you know, if it was a, a black or a Muslim or even sometimes a guy, right? Because the yeah. department is very female dominated. It was just, it wasn't as organic and people tend to choose who they can see themselves being around for eight right. ten hours yeah. a day. So when we're different and we feel like we're excluded, we're not always saying you overtly made a choice that, oh, she's black and she's a female. So right. I can't accept her. Sometimes it's this nuance, like who do I want to hang out with? Who's yeah. the bro? Who's more like me? Mm -hmm. Right? So if we don't have us, in those positions to make those decisions, we get excluded passively, mm -hmm. right? Which is, I think, why it was so great for me meeting you because you were able to open up to me in a way that maybe if you weren't who you were, we may not have had that cultural connection to where we could talk like we just talking. Yeah. Right. And you could be like, oh, shit, Leroy is a cool dude. You know, like, but yeah, Myra's okay, you know? <laughs> yeah. I think that is. You have to learn yeah. to gain trust in people and... You know, I've I've changed and grown and cultivated in even the type of people I hire too, right? We do tend to hire like-minded. That's not the best personality always for your team to understand. You find people that compliment you because 
I'm not maybe best at articulating something some way. So those are the individuals over the years that I've realized that better suit me. I explain to my team, here's my, you know, weaknesses and challenges to make it difficult. If you're an analytical person, <laughs> you know, like a periodist, and I love you guys. <laughs> This is where my weaknesses could be. So understand that those faults, right. but my sales team have been with me a minimum of 10 to 15 years, right? Anyone I lost under seven years is because it was their career choice to move on. Mm. And that was my ultimate success for me is how do I build them to make them better people today? And I would say the majority of my teammates over the last 20 years continue to call me to mentor, right? Now they're mentoring me and they make three times more money, money than I do. I'm like, how is this happening? Two decades younger. Right. Um, but we do learn that and cultivate yeah. to figure out, okay, this is now I, I see where we need to go, but very good point, Dr. Hall. Yeah. <clears throat> so, okay. So you, you're with Zimmer, the regional manager. You, you can share as much as little as you want in how that transitioned to be something different. But where, what was your next step after you spent so many years building up the, the Zimmer brand all over the country? Yeah. Um, I took a little bit of break thinking, you know what? I need to get out of this industry. It's been, uh, I don't know. I was with Zimmer for 18 years. Um, and I started a, um, went to a startup company with my, my boss that also ended up leaving Zimmer at the same time. And that did not pan out for six months because they didn't pay a dime. Um, and then uh, a colleague of mine, a competitive manager, saw that I was out of the industry and asked me to come help Affordable grow the business by mergers and acquisitions and recruiting doctors to come work for DSO in addition to helping elevate the educational side of the implants for the doctors that don't know how to treat implant cases. And right. so I did that for a couple of years. Um, it, it, the the program didn't evolve. And so I was approached by Norris Medical who offers zygomatics and pterygoids. And the reason I went back to an implant company is because I'm like, oh, this is not the traditional single case tooth you know, replacement that I've been doing for so many years. It's kind of the up and coming. Everyone's doing, not everyone, but here's another elevation of helping grow the specialist through to general practitioners and identifying educational opportunities for these patients that have no ridge. Right. And that really excited me. And of course, you know, being able to run the whole United States from start to finish, because I'd love to be the boss sometimes, <laughs> <laughs> um, is what I did. Didn't really pan out. Um, more of a disconnect in regards to the way that they were wanting to run the company versus what we agreed on. Mm -hmm. So I have just in the last six months started my own consulting, taking all the skills that I hopefully know and leveraging some opportunity to find new <clears throat> corporations to bring me on. So that's, that's what's up. So what's, what's yeah. your, 21 is still in the corporate industry. How do you, what advice do you give to someone that may have those same internal conflicts of not that they're doing anything legally wrong, but their yes. their values may not be aligning with your values, but it's a paycheck. It's a good job. But you, you know, know how, do, how do you balance that in, with, with what you feel inside? I, I'm not going to lie. It's a daily struggle um, and an identity struggle for me. My purpose is I have to, I feel like I, I want to be the next president somewhere. I am now because I'm president of my own company. <laughs> so I did receive it, but in all- President Hayes. Yeah. President I like it. PSO, <laughs> uh, consultants. I, my advice and how I deal with it is, and I, sorry for anybody that's not religious, but my life is knowing whatever God's plan is, right? Not my plan. Um, and the purpose of what, the world looks like, you know, and you can take this with no religion or any religion is what are you impacting? How are you impacting people today? Mm -hmm. And that is my number one strive that I continue to try to say is if I don't do anything or I do something, I want to go out and make sure I'm impacting whether it's patients, Dr. Horton, it's my kids, 
it's my husband, it's somebody to know that I'm here to help with something, right? right. Maybe it's a, it's, I, I have my good days and bad days. Um, but corporate America in your twenties and thirties is okay. If you are, you can follow the rules. Um, and I'm still open to doing that. Right. But when it compromises my character at my age and my fifties, I, I don't care. No like, way. I, I don't care. 50s. I, that's so like I should 30s. care. I, I don't <laughs> care what people think of me because if they know who I am, I said this earlier, they know my heart, right? right? I'm strong, but I'm strong for the right reasons. I feel right. And doing right. the right thing for people. Um, and patients and doctors come first. And that all doesn't sometimes align with corporate America. Um, and that's okay. It's, it, it's just maybe not for me right now. Um, yeah. but hopefully somebody sees the value and has that same purpose and same vision where we can kind of grow together because I wouldn't have been at Zimmer for that many years if I didn't have the best boss in the world. He, he right. had the same drive, the same purpose, the same vision, and that it's about who you work for. It's not the company, right? It wasn't right. Zimmer. It was the individuals once we merged that end up happening, but right. it's okay. It's okay. Okay. It sounds so, like a long winded response, but no, no, your history definitely has to be told. Um, it's a rich I think history. one of the questions you asked me earlier that you wanted me to talk about was, you know, what's out there today, like what to look for and maybe make sure you're on top of it. If you decide, excuse me, if you're wanting to bring implants into your practice. <clears throat> well, one of the questions I, I was going to share that with me. One of the questions I was going to ask is, is that, but I, I want to ask a variation of that because I know <laughs> that you've worked with DSOs before and I, I'll tell you my experience and I, you, I, I respect the relationships you got to maintain. So I'm not going to expect you to say anything, but DSOs are taken over and that's just something we have to accept. Right. And I have noticed a almost a predator, predatory recruitment of young doctors by certain DSOs over promising. Mm -hmm. Oh, you work where you want to work. You could do it. We, we were just on a, a, a call as our as perio residents with a, a DSO company that was trying to recruit us. And they were just promising the world. And I'm a little older. You could tell. Black don't crack, so I'm actually 83. I just look really young, <laughs> right? Yeah, you look good. <laughs> right. But um, I'm not going to say what's good or bad. I'm not going to ask what's good or bad. But I do want to know, because there are some people that join DSOs and find out the hard way it's not what they thought and end up leaving. So in your experience, what doctor type or personality type usually <laughs> does not cut it? in a DSO? Someone like Dr. Horton. Mm. Uh -oh. <laughs> I, I, I say that um, if you're self-motivated and very driven and understand how to run a business, not mm -hmm. just a business, because you can be a good specialist, right? Or a doctor, but you may not know how to run a business. And I think that's the challenge of anyone getting into industry right after you, you know, fin finish any of your residency. Um, they don't really teach you to say, here's the, you know, PLs and got to make sure that you have so many staff. How long is it going to take you to do this procedure? What type of education do you have? How can you leave office Monday through Friday? Um, I don't, I am not opposed to anyone starting at a DSO. If they make the, you know, I, my, my only advice would be just read the contract and see what your commitment looks like. Um, yes. and it they help you pay off your bills right? right initially and if it's a good fit and you like somebody else to run it for you then i think it's a great way to go but if it's someone that you think you can be a self starter and do all that yourself or you have family members to help you or if you have a team out there that you identified with that can help you do that you know start your own business <clears throat> right. now you can't really classify at one particular individual, but the ones that we've had to let go in our DSO world are the ones that are not motivated. They just mm -hmm. expect you to, 
you know, have everybody else run the show. You still have to be a leader and lead your team right. to be accountable. And some people just want to go back into their office and sit there and let everybody else do it. And they don't earn the respect from the staff. Right. Even though so-called affordable owns you or the individuals, you still have ownership in it. I mean, there's different DSOs that run differently. With affordable, it's 50-50, you're responsible. So for right. It. Now, is that messaging clear? Because I feel like in all the recruitment conversations I've mm -hmm. had with different companies, they make it sound literally like we do all the running, managing, you just show up, do dentistry and go home. So yes. do you think people are getting sold that bill of goods? And so they're like almost they're obstinate and thinking like, no, yeah. I was told I don't have to do that. You're probably right. Yeah, I, you're I mean, that's the way I would probably position it, but I'm not the recruiter right. at that DSO. But you're right. That's they are positioning things like that. Mm -hmm. So okay. I think understanding how to ask the right questions prior to going into the contract is very important. You know, some people want to be hands-on and when they'll allow you to do whatever you want to do if you're producing. Right. In the end. Right. Gotcha. And so, you know, the tools and the resources are there from an educational standpoint. Um, if you take advantage of you know, what they have to offer. Right. I would definitely encourage taking advantage of all of it, learn it, let them pay for it, and then go out and start your own business. Yeah. You know, I liken it, I liken it to the military, right? If you just joined the military because the recruiter told you you can get stationed in Hawaii and have a great four years, like, oh, and you don't have a plan, you're going to have a horrible four years because you're going to be in Fort Benning, Georgia, digging ditches yeah. for four years, right? But if you yeah. go in there with a the, with the plan, this is how I'm going to get my education <laughs> paid for. This is how I want to score on the aptitude test so I can get this type Great of idea. job and position myself. But that being said, we've, we've talked about implants and GPs getting into implants. Is that a good thing? And, I, and obviously, I always ask this question because I see how I was 15 years ago versus what I know now. And everybody can retrospectively look back and be like, okay, I, I was definitely not as good then as I am now. Do you think it's been a positive for the patient outcome, for patient outcomes, now that so many GPs are taking these weekend courses and they're implantologists? Hmm. That's very broad. I think my first response, and again, these are only my opinions. Mm -hmm. um, no, the answer is... <laughs> No, I don't think it's great that everyone just gets into implants at all. Um, I think, be, you know, way back when we started, the two of us, I think you were very fortunate to have UW offer this. There's still mm -hmm. a lot of universities not offering, but, you know, we probably had 20 programs back then. At Zimmer was really the state of the art to offer all these third year resident program. Now every implant company is offering it. <clears throat> so someone's getting some type of exposure, I would think at the university level at this point, but really back 20 years ago, we really didn't have that. Right. Um, but the minor exposure would be really understanding the treatment plan of the patient and getting into these study clubs to identify the cases. That is where I feel most of these doctors should focus on before they get into starting to place implants. Okay. You can still grow your business and increase your revenue substantially, even more by referring your cases out or bringing a specialist in to do them. Right. Right. But that's again, and that's part of my job here at the DSO is identifying whether they're skilled or not. And you don't have to do them. There's so many people that can help you be successful in a different way. <clears throat> no, that's, that is such big facts right there. Cause that's my biggest selling point to a lot of the offices that I work with. Let me do the hard work of removing the tooth, preserving and building the bone, preparing <clears throat> the site, putting the implant in. That's my liability. That's my work. All you got to do is you take an impression, just follow some sound restorative principles, screw it down, slap some composite. 
right? That's the easiest $1,500 to $2,000 you made in your life. Let me set that up for you, right? And in in teaching um, GPs who have taken some of my courses, I feel like if they can do the easy ones, they end up referring a lot more complicated ones to me, but because their mind is thinking implants, they're doing a lot less bridges. Right. 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 But we do see people get into trouble, people with these fly-by-night classes. What are some of the experiences you've had where you may have had to tell a doctor, specialist or not, or GP, that, oh, maybe you shouldn't be doing this? Have you you had that? Have you been in that position? Oh, that's my job. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) that's my consulting job. Okay. Um. I think to gain the trust of the general practitioner um, or anyone coming in brand new at our DSO, I'm assigned certain practices. And if you do it in a manner, to, and excuse me, in a manner that's respectful and ident- you know, identify here's where we should start mm-hmm. and then get them into the educational courses to help them build the confidence is okay. That's kind of a no, but yes, in the future. I'm not a doctor. Can I read (laughs) the CBCTs better than some? I I think Uh, so. I think so too. So the reason they have us is to identify the opposite. And then we get one of our clinical doctors to come in and put the stamp of approval. Okay. So that's how it works at our DSO, where I'll set up a call with one of our clinical doctors. Here's what we're thinking. Can you walk the doctor through this? Do you think that this is a great first case? Um, and then we, I'll be there or bring in, I'll bring in a vendor, just help support with any of the materials. And the vendor and I will walk that doctor through step-by-step to kind of help them with their educational and their journey. Um, but yes, I tell them all the time. Whether they listen or not, it's a different story, right? Right. I've assessed it as somebody else has signed off on it. And then I, you know, explain it to the operational team or corporate. And, you know, that's that's all I can say or do. <clears throat> so the, the game's obviously changed over the years, especially the years that I've known you. It's been the advent of technology, the accessibility yeah. of technology. Do you still love what you do? I love it. Yeah. I keep trying to get out of it. I just, you know, I, my passion is something else, but I wish I could retire. Right. Right. (laughs) But I do continue to fall back. I am just finding different opportunities that I love to do, but I want to stay in the industry if that's, Mm. but being strategic um, and finding creative ways to help grow the business. And I said earlier, leading a team and, Mentoring people is what I enjoy doing, but all of it is around education. And so if I can stay in that realm to continue educating in some sort or, you know, bringing people together like a date, like, you know, relationships with specialists and doctors, <laughs> it, it's like a puzzle. And right. uh, yeah, the, I don't think that will ever end. You're, the, I, cu- I you're the Cupid it. of the implant industry, just ah, merging people should. together, you know? <laughs> <laughs> we should do that. Oh, wait, that's more of a yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so let me ask you this because I'm you know, we want to wrap up here pretty soon. <clears throat> We've talked about implants and the industry changes. You've been in a position where you've led teams. I, I really want to make sure we hit this point because leadership is not for everybody, but it can be for everybody or for anybody that wants to pursue it. Yeah. We've talked about how to become an implantologist, right? You you got to focus on education, take your time, uh, do study clubs, communicate and collaborate with others. <clears throat> yes. How can someone be a leader and how, you know, from someone like you, who's been an industry leader, an amazing industry leader, and I'm firsthand witness to that. Mm-hmm. Is it just an inherent personality trait or are some of these things learned behaviors and skill sets? Gosh, I would say the answer is no, because we all know that there's a lot of leaders out there that should not be leaders, right? I mean, I don't think 
I'm perfect by any means. I've made a lot of mistakes. I've been a manager in different industries before I started implants and I was forced into them and I was terrible. Mm. And I look back now on understanding why did I do it that way? Right. I always use things like, well, Steve told me to say that to you. Well, who does that? How do you gain respect? I think I've made so many mistakes that I've led to help me understand, you know, do unto others as you do unto you, or you lead by example, or you lead based on how you want to be treated. Mm. So personally, that's how I've grown. But to anybody, I think, yeah, go for it. If that's where you think you want to drive into any type of role, it doesn't mean I have to lead a team of 40 people like I just did. It might be just mentoring right in your own backyard with your staff. That's your leadership. Everybody has that role as a manager right now. You lead your kids, you lead your parents at some point. That's, you know, we are in our, that life, like our life is about taking care of our parents right now, but <clears throat> go for it. If it's meaning leading a team like I'm doing in implant sales, you know, there's courses for it. Right. But I think it all leads and strives from hard work and and proven success that gets you there. I don't okay. know if that helped answer the question. No, absolutely. Everyone's a leader. Absolutely. And to go for it. Absolutely go for it. All right. So I got some rapid fire questions for you to end oh, our session God. today. Uh, don't don't overthink it. Just uh, short, succinct answers. First thing that comes to your mind. Um, so, what do you look forward to every single day? Like I said, uh, well, that's a lot. Okay, and you want a short and sweet. Mm. What do I look forward to every day? What's the, what's the one thing aside from everything else that you look forward to every day? Just bringing joy into somebody's life. I like that. Really, whether it's through my kids, my parents, husband, or the people uh, that I work with every day. Absolutely. Can you be good at something if you don't love it? No. Or can you be great at something if you don't love it? No. Okay. And you love what you do? I love what I do. Oh. If you won the lottery, would you still, in some way or capacity be in the industry yes yes <laughs> we start our company when, when we were talking about offline we, we're going to start our company if you want to lie you or i win the lottery what do you want to be remembered i'm going for? to win by the way i just bought some tickets so yeah you got to manifest it absolutely yeah. <laughs> speak it into existence what do, what do you want to be remembered for oh gosh <clears throat> i think about that all the time oh I want to be remembered that I was contagious, you know, with not just being passionate and angry because people don't do their job the way they're supposed to be doing it, but that I gave something to them, right? Um, an impact of something, whether it was a smile that day or, you know, being patient or having a joyful conversation or having fun and laughing, right? I love to have fun when I'm working with the staff. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of things, but just if I left today, it's just, okay, I remember Myra. I remember she was just contagious with all the positive energy that she could give to anyone. <laughs> And not and not the not COVID that, easy, but... and not the COVID that she has today, right? Yes, I know. Even though it doesn't seem like I feel so much better, I think it's because I'm doing this interview with you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Listen, if you could talk to your your 20 year old self, what's the the best piece of advice you'd give yourself at 20? Who cares what people think? Mm. You know, always trying to prove myself so I can be that part of that group or that crowd or be accepted um being an african-american and asian and female and i don't know did i meet all five requirements <laughs> i age i'm the age right now too um we just all want to you know we want to be accepted and 
that was tough for me, right? I think my parents were great parents, but they were really never around. I raised mm. my brother on my own and I took care of myself working three or four jobs pretty much my whole life. And so you, you lose yourself sometimes. And I'm not a words of affirmation type of, you know, <clears throat> love language. But once in a while, it's nice to say, you know what, you did a good job. Let's let's promote you or you did a good job. Let's do this. And I think a lot of people like to take credit for things that you've done and you just let it go. But, you know, you grow up and I don't really care about that now. But at 20, right. that's probably what I would have said. OK, well, listen, yeah. I, I do want to tell you, you know, and I, I know I laid it on fake in the beginning, so I got to end it in the same way. Oh, gosh, you. um I was, you know, with everything that happened, anyone that knows me kind of knows what happened in my family the last couple of years. I have been thinking about more and more like, what legacy do you leave behind, right? And I feel like the way you've impacted me, I know I'm not the only one out here, Aww. right? And yeah, so I want you- to cry. <laughs> Let's cry here. The guys don't cry on this thing. <laughs> So I do want you to to sincerely know that over the years of you being in this industry, I my story that includes you as such an wow. impactful person is not unique. Wow. So when you say I want to have left a mark on the world, I can guarantee you, promise you, that in conversations you will never know occurred your name has come up because I know they have for me because you've been instrumental to my life and my career, everything that I do. And I do want you to know, just like anyone that's been special to my life in my life, I want you to know that you live on through me and everything that I do, there's a piece of you in that as well. Um, and so I, I want to say thank you. I want you to thank you for coming on the show and sharing your story and hopefully we can have you back when my, non-reminder emailing uh <laughs> co-host gets back on the ball and he's out of timeout but i i think there's That's so fault. much right <laughs> there's so much you have to offer not just this industry but i think anyone that's either new to the industry getting into it um and i a thousand thank yous and appreciations oh. for you braving covid to come on this show just for me oh. i'm so flattered I'm just, um, I missed it once. I'm thankful for the opportunity. And wow, that's, I don't know what to say. See, even if I get a thank you once in a while, I don't know what to do because it's not <laughs> in the Asian culture. Complimentary is not, <laughs> you know. <clears throat> but for anybody else listening, you know, feel free to give them my phone number. I am always available for any questions. And if I don't know it, I'll get you the resource, especially when it comes to vendor relationships and mm. the type of pricing structures that you're getting. Um, you know, don't overpay or overpay, you know, is it worth it or what's, what's up and coming and what's new? And do you need a connection with the, any of the relationships that I, I have to offer when it comes to the implants again, but yeah. digital digital's where the industry is going. So a lot of that is there. Well, that's what's up. We'll, we'll put all your information in the, the show notes on the, the YouTube broadcast. Um, but again, thank you for coming on the show. Um, thank you, Dr. Horton. I look forward to coming to Arizona and hanging out or next time you're in Washington, me and my wife will have you and if you're bring your husband, your kids. Let's let's definitely make some time to reconnect yeah. in person because it's it's been a while. So all the love and light. Thank you so much, Myra Haynes. And uh, thank you to everyone who tuned in to this you, amazing everybody. episode. Take yes. care. All right. Have a good day. Thank you for listening to this episode of Tooth Be Told. The opinions on this episode are just that, our opinions. Please consult your dental professional before taking any action with your dental health. If you have any questions about anything you heard on this episode, please contact us at Real Dentist with an S. That's R E A L dentist with an s at gmail.com we would be very happy to return any message that we receive because we love the communication that we have with our listeners